Hello, uh, I'm with my presentation. My name is uh, Jeff Boyer. This is a presentation on something I call Integral Geometry. And it's a counter argument to using parallel line segments in field theory. Uh, if you want to reach me, you can, I have, for any kind of, uh, if you want the slides after the presentation, you can reach me at jpboyer, nps at gmail.com. I'm going to give you a little bit of my background, my biography, pretty much on, because it's important to understand why it is I chose this to study. Um, I was a, in the Navy for about 10 years, U.S. Navy. I was an industrial electrician after that for a while. And uh, in about 2006, I decided to get my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. Uh, during that time, I was picked up for a Ph.D. fellowship, uh, straight from bachelor's to Ph.D., which I started in 2008. Uh, and I'm considered what's called a Ph.D. candidate, which means all I lack is a dissertation in defense. But uh, during that time that I was in grad school, I also attended the Air Force Institute of Technology on Wright Pad Air Force Base, where I was studying microelectrical mechanical systems and developed a side interest in the understanding of tensors and how they're used in field theory. So the course of what I was researching through was MIMS, microelectrical mechanical systems. This is where you can etch monocrystal and silicon, and you can make accelerometers or phones so that you can you know, tell how fast they're moving and everything. While I was studying that, I found out that uh, the accelerometers and all these little devices we made out of silicon are modeled for elasticity tensors. And funny enough, I found out that general relativity also uses the same type of mathematics, different concepts, but the same type of mathematics. And while I was looking at that, I ran across something called a scalar multiple of a metric. It's called the cosmological constant. And there's a way to look at the cosmological constant as a constant of integration. Now this bothers me greatly because I, it was at odds with how I understood relativity at work. And up until probably, probably about five years ago, I had no problem with relativity. Um, I assumed I'd always learned that, you know, speed of light's constant, all frames of reference. I assumed that they had known everything that they, uh, they had looked at everything that they could have. I didn't, I've never really heard the word ether. Um, that's not something you're taught physics class. You know, I'm, I was taught in my physics class, there's not a problem in physics. But once I found about the cosmological constant problem in dark energy, I couldn't um, mentally equate how you could have a constant of integration in relativity. And this is what a lot of this presentation is about. So, and this might be kind of a controversial slide, but I was part of the, I would say, the general public's mathematics community. I had no idea that there were as of the mid 2000s, that there were really anything wrong with our interpretation of physics. Once I started finding out about the fundamental paradox and everything, I have a choice of what is going to get my PhD. Do I follow the observational cosmologists and the quantum gravity community to say, yes, there is something wrong? But I also found out there's a distant science community, which is actually what they want to do is they're not just trying to modify equations. And here in this group, you know, we're welcome to go back and research everything from the ground up, right? We can throw, you can throw a flat earth theory out here as long as you're willing to defend it. That's not something you can do in the mainstream physics community. If you try to say that the, the special theory of relativity is wrong, I have to, there's no quarter for me within the mainstream physics community. So I had to make a choice, and I, but I want you to understand why I made that choice and so that you can understand a little bit more about me. Um, if somebody asks you, does the NASA DOE, the National Science Foundation, do they have a problem with modern day physics? Most people would say, no, they, they think everything's fine. But if you do an objective look, you're certain of their papers. This is called the Report of Dark Energy Task Force. This is a little excerpt up here, and it says, most experts believe that nothing short of a revolution in our understanding of fundamental physics will be required to achieve a full understanding of cosmic acceleration. So regardless of what I'm putting up here. Just as if you're coming from the mainstream physics community, how do you justify that uh, statement when we're still teaching physics as if there's no problem with anything we're teaching in the regular courses? In addition, in the answer, one of the things they're looking at is whether or not a dynamical fluid is responsible for this cosmic acceleration. So, is NASA looking at ether theories? Is DOE looking at ether theories? <laughs> Is the National Science Foundation looking at ether theories? Well, they might say no, but I would argue, you know, if, if you're willing to argue with semantics, you know, maybe you're not really trying
trying to do science, but you're looking for equations that fit your universe instead of trying to find, uh, you know, a you know, they're looking for a universe that fits their equations. Whereas in here, we should be looking for equations that model our universe. So this is a, a small little video clip by Lawrence Krauss. Um, you don't really have to know exactly what he's saying or what he's talking about, but I do want to illustrate that there is a group of scientists that are starting to sound a lot like dissident scientists. So I believe that this group is really coming into its uh, own. So I want to play this real quick. And it's about the subject I'm dealing with here. Great. So let's go back to Einstein. Sorry. <laughs> Little lab. Uh, Einstein had this cosmological term. He said, I was my biggest blunder. I want to throw it out, get rid of it. But the problem is you can't get rid of it so easily. Because using the miracle of modern mathematics, you can rewrite that equation. And um, now this is, this is a small step for a mathematician, but a giant leap for a physicist. Not because it's that hard to put this term over there, most of us can do that, but because it now represents something very different when it's on this side of the equations. Here it was somehow a geometric quantity. When it's here, it looks like a new contribution of the energy and momentum of the universe. What could contribute a term like this? And we know the answer. Nothing. By nothing, I don't mean nothing, I mean nothing. If you take empty space, and that means get rid of all the particles, all the radiation, absolutely everything. So there's nothing there. If that nothing weighs something, then it contributes a term like this. Now, that sounds ridiculous. Why should nothing weigh something? Nothing is nothing. And the answer is nothing isn't nothing anymore in physics. Because of the laws of quantum mechanics and special relativity, on extremely small scales, nothing is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't see them. Now again, that sounds like philosophy, like counting the number of angels on the head of a pin, or religion, or something useless. I shouldn't say, Dan Dennett is here, I shouldn't say philosophy is useless. But, um, anyway, um, he's also a friend. But, uh, the point is, it, we can't measure virtual particles directly, but we can measure their effects indirectly. And in fact, they're responsible for the best predictions in physics. Here, by the way, is actually a, 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 an animation that was shown at the Nobel Prize ceremonies about five years ago by a friend of mine who opened up the Nobel Prize for, for developing the theory that produced this. This is the space inside of a proton, the empty space inside of a proton. Not where the quarks are, but the empty space between the quarks. And this is not a, this is an animation, but it's an exact animation coming from physical calculations. This is what the space looks like. Now, how do we know that? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the things are, it turns out most of the mass of the proton comes not from the quarks within a proton, but from the empty space between the quarks. These fields popping in and out of existence produce about 90% of the mass of a proton. And since protons and neutrons are the dominant stuff in your body, the empty space is responsible for 90% of your mass. So, these empty space is vital to science, and these calculations are vital to understanding not just protons, but electrons and atoms, and produce the best comparisons, the, and I will repeat this, the best comparisons between theory and experiment in all of science. To 10 decimal places in quantum electrodynamics, using these calculations, we can get the right answer. It's amazing. So, if that's the case, let's calculate the energy of nothing where there's nothing else. And when we do that, we come up with a calculation which is pretty bad. It's the worst prediction in all of physics. We calculate, you can't even see it, I think, there's a one at the end of that. We calculate that the energy of empty space is a gazillion times the energy of everything we see. That, as I say, is the worst prediction in all of physics, which is why we didn't talk about it for a long time. We calculate that empty space should have an energy of 120 orders of magnitude more than galaxies and stars and people and aliens and all the rest. And if that were the case, we just wouldn't be here. So if we knew something was wrong with this calculation, it's been around since I was a graduate student. And we, we, we knew what the answer was. Theorists always know the answer, they're sometimes right. Uh, the, um, we knew the answer was zero, because it's the only sensible answer. Because, you know, you can't, you can't cancel a big number like this. Let's say the energy of empty space was comparable to the energy of everything we see. Well, we'd have to cancel this big number to 120 decimal places and leave a 
finite answer in the 121st decimal place. No one knows how to do that in science. So that's a little overview of the theoretical problem of the cosmological constant. Let's talk a little, just a little bit if you're going to come from the mainstream and you want to know about the observational issues of the cosmological constant. Okay, and so the great thing about this was, if you will recall, this is Yale University. Three different lines on a two-dimensional graph, and they all plot cross at the same point. And again, point. you don't have to just listen to what he has to say. The theory, because it is not necessarily true that if you put down three lines at random in a two-dimensional space, that they will all cross at the same point. And so the fact that they do makes you think that something about how we understand what's going on is, is going pretty much right, because uh, uh, there's no reason for these things to, to cross the point. We predict that they do, because you know they're all measuring the same universe, but in different ways. And so the fact that they do uh, lends some credence to this whole uh, 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 wonderful set of stories. But there's another way of looking at this plot, which is to look at what these axes are. What are we actually plotting? on this plot. This omega that shows up is the uh, ratio of the density of something to the critical density of the universe. So this is, this axis is effectively the density of the dark matter. And this axis here is the density of the dark energy. So what we are plotting in this wonderful plot where everything works out so nicely is the density of something we don't know anything about versus the density of some other thing that we don't know anything about. Uh, and so in a certain sense, uh, the fact that we're working regardless of where the lines are, the fact that we've got these two axes means we don't have any idea what's going on. Uh, so that's uh, perhaps the more pessimistic view. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, thinking about this, you get a kind of faint odor of episodes. Remember epicycles? Epicycles I talked about in the very first class, the very first lecture of this class. This was this business uh, back in the Middle Ages where they thought the Earth was still the center of the universe, and they were trying to figure out what was going on with the orbits of the planets. Uh, and they discovered that uh, a single circle for each planet didn't do the job. It didn't concord with what, uh, what the observations were. So they said, all right, well, uh, you know, you know the Earth's the center of the universe, and we know everything has to be circles, so we'll put circles on top of circles. And then they were able to match the observations. But then the observations got better, and they had to have ever more complicated uh, circles on top of circles. So. Uh, I mean, so that was the story of epicycles back in the Middle Ages. And then, of course, what it turned out is that the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe and the idea that everything goes in circles are just wrong. And as soon as you abandon those two ideas and have the idea that the planets go in ellipses around the sun, all of a sudden everything gets much simpler and it's all explained. Well, so what's happening in cosmology now? We're observing the motions of galaxies and of objects within galaxies like supernovae that we can see. The first thing we found out is that the rotation of galaxies and other indicators of matter don't, aren't in accord with what we expect, so we invent dark matter uh, to explain the internal motions of galaxies and galaxy clusters. We then discover that the external motion, the motion of these things through the universe, uh, also doesn't accord with what we would have expected, so we invent dark energy in order to explain that. So we've now, in the past 25 years, invented two, two different but completely imaginary, uh, 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 as far as we know, uh, concepts to fill 96% of the universe with to uh, figure out uh, what's going on with the fact that the motions we observe are not the motions we expect. How many more? You know, let's go out and measure some more things. Then maybe we'll need dark something else. Uh, and dark something else after that. Uh, and maybe it needs to change with time. And maybe it needs to magically appear halfway through the history of the universe or something like that. Who knows? You know, if you keep inventing these things, of course you can explain anything you like. Just in exactly the same way that if you have enough epicycles, you can have a model with the Earth at the center of the universe that explains all the motions of the planets you see. You know, if you get to just keep inventing words here, uh, of course you can explain the universe. And, you know, what would have happened if this line didn't come across? 
Supposing that line had been up there, what would you have done? What you would have said is, well, of course, we don't understand dark energy, so we've just proved that dark energy varies with time, or varies spatially, or uh, uh, becomes opaque at large distances, or some other quant quality, and then we would have rewritten this graph so that they do cross. Uh, that's not very compelling. Um, and indeed, uh, it has gotten sufficiently embarrassing that there is now just beginning to be a feeling that maybe what's going on is we need new laws of physics. Maybe we're at a moment like the end of the 16th century or the end of the 19th century where the current basic ideas that we base our, our, our theories of the universe are, are about to be uh, radically transformed. That's possible. It's a the last part is thanks. It is also possible maybe we'll discover a dark matter particle and they'll find all this out magically and it'll all be solved. But maybe not. So regardless of anything I put up here, this is what attracted me to natural philosophy and that we have the ability here to go back. Let's go back and examine where we came from. So what I want you to do is I want you to pretend that there's a land of geometry somewhere. And in this land of geometry, there's a castle this castle is founded on the concept that two line segments can be parallel. This castle is huge. It's large. Thousands of mathematicians have been working on this since Euclid. And they talk about surfaces. These are just a few concepts. Tensors, parallel transport of vectors, manifold, geodesics. But at the very top, they're still trying to add on some floors. And they've ran up a couple of, I guess the, the biggest one is a scalar multiple of the metric. But there's also this concept of singularity. And we know it's a black hole. And in 2013, I gave a presentation on the video for the National Philosophy Society, and it wasn't very well. Didn't, but it allows, at least allowed me to start fleshing out my ideas. Since that point, I ran across a four-volume set of the history of general relativity, and there was something very I found very interesting in it, was that there was a theory there called Gunnar Nordstrom's theories. He came up with two theories. The first one was when, you guys know the Mitchells and Morley experiment, was whenever they all said, said, well, everything's four-dimensional. He said, great, I've got three spatial. I'm going to throw one out here with timeline. And he was going to publish that. But what happens, he got a letter from Einstein really quickly that said, you know what, that was the very first thing I tried too. And he said, this is why it didn't work. And he's like, oh, okay. So Gunnar Nordstrom came back and said, well, what if mass reverter? Which Einstein said, well, oh, I didn't think of that. That's an interesting idea. So what I found out was that when general relativity was being developed, they were also working on an alternate theory called Gunnar Nordstrom's theories. So at the same time, they were having these conferences where they were debating these two theories because these seem to be the two most likely to hold an answer. And what's interesting isn't Gunnar Nordstrom's theory in itself, and I don't even have the equation here, but it's how it's structured. It's how it's built when you compare it to relativity. So, Because what I'm really interested in is how are the structures, how are these equations actually built? What are we actually talking about? So uh, let me give you a little bit more example on the cosmological constant, the scaling multiple. This is called the ds squared equation. And you have this g mu mu, the dx mu, and dx mu. And all you have to know is that normally it's just written with the g mu mu. But you could write the cosmological constant. And then you could say, well, the cosmological constant, the units would have something to do with inverse meter squared. No idea what that means. Nobody knows. OK, well, let's throw it in the Einstein field equation. Like he said, we could put it in there, and what does it mean? Nobody knows. It can also even appear in Newton's law of gravity, but nobody has any idea of why it's there. You know, there's theories, nobody has any idea of why it has a value or anything, but it certainly seems to make some kind of geometrical sense, but nobody can figure out any physical way to interpret it, anything that is compelling. If you have a flat metric, you can take this diagonal components of this thing called a matrix. And you can sum them up, call the trace of it. And you can find out that if, if you look at the change from point to point, you get a zero. But it's not the only definition. You can take a cosmological constant. It's called an Einstein manifold, and it's flat also. So general relativity kind of looks like it has infinite definitions of flatness. But the one on the top is the one they use to describe the matter. So the Einstein field equation, if you throw that in there, that lambda g mu nu kind of looks like a constant, but on the right you have this t mu nu, and inside there are these symbols for rho and p. They change, and they change the g mu nu on the other side, right? 
And just another illustrative point here, they call this lambda gene mu, it has something to do with the energy density of the vacuum, and they even call it flu. So this is in uh, 2012. So in order for me to be able to ask a question I didn't, what, didn't have the ability before, I'm going to have to build a different house in the land of geometry so I can ask this question. But what I'm asking is, can I eliminate parallel line segments and constants of integration from relativity by using a relative area function instead? Now, if you were to go to a book and look up a relative area function, you wouldn't find it. Because you have to be able to build another structure to be able to ask this question. If you live up in the cast of the parallelism and you look out, what you'll see is two parallel line segments, and you will see that they're parallel. They don't intersect. But you're also going to see that at the curve, there is a point where they intersect, that the line segments curve. If you're in the house of area, though, you see two perpendicular line segments. And instead, what you see is that these perpendicular line segments, they bound the area. The interesting thing about this bounding of an area is that what happens if this area changes? So what happens if both line segments change at one time? We could label the left, the vertical one, just S vertical. So it's got some magnitude. Don't know what it is. We have S horizontal. It has some magnitude. We don't know what it is. But we can tell the relative change of the rectangle. So the question I have from a physical point of view is, can I have that left line segment there, can it have something to do with the magnitude of pressure and density change of a perfect fluid? Well, if that's true, if that changes, can I have the bottom one has something to do with the change of spatial and temporal probability of a wave? Simple as that. If it, if it changes one side, does the other change? And we're looking at a change of area. That's where the integration, the integral part of this comes from. It's because integration is a concept of summing area. But there's also other concepts that we really don't talk about. No prior research that I could find on this. So now I have this little house of area, and my little black sheep, he's able to look at geometry from a different viewpoint than they do from the castle of uh, parallelism. So he can have his own little equation, and they can have theirs. And he gets, now has the ability to start comparing stuff. So what I want you to pretend is that on the top of this I have integral geometry, on the bottom I have what I say is general relativity. Now integral geometry views area either absolute or relative. General relativity views curvature. So I'm going to pretend that I'm a little particle and I'm trucking along and I'm going to say, you know what, as I move along I have this aura about me, I have this field, and if I take the gradient of this field I can find out how much I attract in the particle. Still hear me? Yeah. Okay. And general relativity says, no, 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 no. If you're a particle moving along, that's not true. What you actually do is you create a dimple in space-time. You're actually curving space itself. Let me put that back up there so you have it. Now, in natural philosophy, what we have instead is we have, I would propose this. My question is, what do you see up there? As natural philosophers, I'm in Boca Raton, Florida, and I'm looking at a screen, and I see colored blocks changing size. And that's the correct answer. Area is a tool. So we use changes of area. We can use that to model physical changes of our universe. So we have a language which we use to describe what you and I are, what waves are. And I don't think Gauss, there's a possibility Gauss and Ryman, when they were looking at manifolds and everything, what they were taking is when they did a, a partial derivative and they were tra transporting these vectors around the manifolds and stuff, that there was nothing, they didn't realize there might be another way to look at it. Oh, and let me go back. The bottom part is the cosmological constant. What that simply means is that I have a blocks of area which are any size you want on the left, but they don't change. That is the point of saying that maybe we're looking at one specific way to look at curvature. They pick one out, the number one, and I'll show you why. And, but there might be other definitions of flatness, but maybe that's the logical fallacy of what we're doing. Maybe not.
it's starting to look that way. So on the top I have integral geometry, and I'm looking at constant change in relative area. On the bottom I have GR, of general relativity. But they look at this curvature, I've shown it in terms of change in block of area. So the key to understanding what I'm talking about is to understand the difference between parallel curve lines and constant and change in relative area. The difficulty is I have to break everything down into a deconstruct equation down to the components. Um, and that's not something normally done. You know, who goes back and looks at general relativity? And, and how do we found it? So in the council of parallelism, my little sheet guy is going to start talking to the parallel guy. And the castle of parallelism guy is going to say, well, you seem to be a little decent at geometry. Why don't you come and help us add more floors? But is that a wise decision? Because our sheep understands it. He's got his equation here where we have a vertical line segment and a horizontal line segment. And we have the other DS squared equation. And of course, the, the our little parallel guy says, well, this is a description of the metric G and mu changes space and time. So DS squared from point to point changes if G and mu changes, which is what he states there. And you can write this in a matrix format. Okay, 16 components. Why 16? Because, of course, we had the Michelson Morley experiment. We have 2 to the 4th power, 16 components. Great. That's handy. We can also write the components of space time in matrix format. So we have the genu nu and the components of space time. Well, my little sheet guy says, well, mine's nothing more really than an infinitesimal slice of area. So what you can do, I can have my area change. But we really don't look at the area. We look at the infinitesimal slice. And my infinitesimal slice can change. But if I'm looking at an infinitesimal slice, and my vertical one is my independent variable, and my dependent is the, the horizontal one, it makes it a little bit difficult to imagine visually the difference between absolute area and relative area. Unless you understand that we're looking at little points of slices of area, which again he states here. We have the, you can have a change in area or a changing slice of area. And in, just, and in a house of area, we call this a geometric one form. There's also the concept of this in general relativity. They don't look at it in the terms of area. And we, we can write 16 components of slices of area. It can be written in a matrix format. He says, you know, there's something funny about your DS squared equation. He decides to take the S vertical part here. Remember the horizontal part I switched down to nothing? He decides to take that S vertical part and do the same, and he puts the ratio in here. He moves that part over here underneath this. So now we have this. I have two DSs out here. I have two points of a horizontal and vertical. And he realizes this starts to look a little bit similar to that. So I asked him, where does your GMU new come from? Which, of course, if you look through some of the gravitation books, it's just assumed to exist. There's no real explanation of why GMU new has to be there. And he says, well, where does your line set come from, the sheep? The sheep says, well, all we're doing there is I'm assuming that one relative change is a function of the other relative change. And then we're looking at the area between the line segments. So a line segment, according to the sheep, all it does is represent change. So now it lines these up. You know, this doesn't seem to appear up here, but what if S vertical was a 1? You wouldn't have to write it in, would you? But he says, you know, you have this little ratio here, and you have dx mu, or dx mu and dx nu up here. And what he realizes is that he's mixing geometrical and physical terms. So the, this ratio, this g mu, is actually the vertical line segment over its own point. But down here, we look at it as a geometric effect. Up here, we're looking at it as something physical. We're looking at it as having something to do with space and time in the same equation. And the sheep says, haven't you ever wondered why you have eight components of space time in this equation? This x vertical and this x mu, there's 0, 1, 2, 3 in here. There's 0, 1, 2, 3 in here. I count eight separate components in that equation. He says, you know what, I think your gene you knew is a middle man. He said it appears that you need this because what you're doing is you're not saying I, on one side of the fence I have something geometrical, and on the other I have something physical. You're mixing two components. Maybe somewhere along the line you're going to get a component that's going to look physical and geometrical at the same time, and you're not going to know what to do with it. 
So he said, let's take a look at your field equation. This is the Einstein field equation. I got this T mu nu, and over here I got my RG mu. And of course, you got the speed of light and a pi and there's new gravitational constant. He says the T mu nu, see it up there on the right? That has something called rho and p in it. And it's meant to be written in matrix notation there. But he said, remember that other thing you had? You also had that lambda g mu nu, which you don't know what to do with. That goes, that was fit right here. We didn't leave it in there because we're gonna, we don't really need to argue about it right now, but we could later. He says, looking closer, it looks like in here I have a rho and a p, whatever we want to call those, you know, let's, let's call it spade spade here. Let's just say philosophically, we don't know what they are. But you're saying this, inside this TMU new, there's a rho and a p, when those change, those change the GMU new. And then you come down here and the GMU new changes, well, that changes this d is squared from point to point, so I'm changing space and time. So, is space and time modified by this middleman? And if I say, well, the g mu nu has got to be a 1, that way I can say this is Euclidean, because that way it doesn't change. But then again, if we could stick any constant in there, it doesn't matter. It says maybe your little lambda here is your Gordian knot. That's kind of the exposing some of the fallacies in your equations. So in the castle parallelism, they've got two terms up here for geometry, this g mu nu and this lambda g mu nu. And down here in the physical part, they have some rho and p. And down here, there's space and time. So I have something up here that has something to do with perfect fluids. Down here, I have space and time. And we're using this middleman to kind of like try to describe the relationship between them. But we don't know what to do with this one. And then the house of area, he says, you know, all I got <laughs> is a little line segment that's an infinitesimal slice of area. And I have these physical terms down here, which I postulate. And I'm saying, I mean, maybe these are governed by this relationship here. And what we're actually looking at are slices of area and not curvature of lines. Now this is what I would propose as replacement for the energy momentum tensor. This is what forces me into the natural velocity movement. Because I'm saying, well, what if we just say that the energy, the density and pressure of the vacuum, see how it goes all the way across, is a, that the, and then we have down here, we have, I'm going to call this temporal probability and spatial probability. So what happens if this term on the bottom is a function of this one? So if this, what happens if there is no change in the relative density of the vacuum? Does, would that mean that there is, if there's no area, does that mean there's no particle, no wave? Would that be a decent model? I could hold my temporal probability constant, and what I would end up with is something that looks very much like, like a redefined Poisson equation. And also, I have this little b down here, which this term, if we hold it constant, we have two ways of looking at, at waves. We have the wave that it occupies in what we would consider space, and I have a wave that gets moves. If this b is a constant here, then I could sit there and say, well, I could tell the difference between how two waves moving just by measuring their changes of area between each other, the relative changes. This, however, is not geometrically plausible as being the speed of light. Because it would also, because we're looking at not just the points in the wave, we're looking at integrating the whole wave. So if I have two clocks, and they're going through space, but the clocks aren't the same. If I have one, it's a little nuclear clock, and I have one with big bend. As we start increasing much larger and larger velocities, the line segments decide to change, and I would argue the probabilities inside the change, it's plausible that they'll both start ticking at different rates. I have no, I'm having a problem with space-time dilation and changing clock rates, but I do have a problem saying that two integrals of two different waves are going to produce a clock that ticks at the same rate, no matter the construction. So if that's true, how is, is it really possible to say that the speed of light can be constant? You know, if you have two clocks and you build them identically in a gravitational well, and one of them's Big Ben and one of them's nuclear clock. And you send a counterpart that's identical down the well and bring it back and you say, aha, it changed down the gravitational well, the time changed. But you take both of those clocks and you send them down the gravitational well and you go with it. 
and they both start ticking at different rates. They're not longer synchronized. It's the speed of light, constant, even in a gravitational way. So either inertial or non-inertial frames. <clears throat> so basically what I'm asking is, can the temporal and spatial probability of a wave be a function of the pressure density of a perfect fluid? This is just based simply, uh, you know, it gets a little bit more intense here. So I'm just, all I'm caring about is the area here. This is not an absolute line segment. We're actually looking at relative changes of area, and we have to postulate a line segment. And just to reiterate, this is, this is the area inside this line. Just like we do field potentials, this is the area inside that line. And um, back here, if area is finite and quantized, if, if this area here, if I can measure this area, is that a quantization of the wave? So, just to iterate again, our little parallel guy says, well, top and bottom of this, they look parallel to me. My little sheet guy says, well, it looks like a constant area to me as I move along. The little parallel guy says, well, that looks like a singularity to me. I now end up in an equation of zero. And my sheet guy says, well, I, I think you just ran out of area. And my little parallel guy says, well, I stick a constant out here, it still looks parallel. And my little sheet guy says, well, it looks more like specific relativity to him since all the changes are specific to one and they didn't pick like a different constant. So what I'm saying is it's starting to seem to me that what they've done is they've mistaken curvature. These lines that see how they change from one another, they say, well, the curve's different. It seems like what they've done, and up here they don't change, that they've mistaken changing relative area for curvature. In the house of area, flatness means no area. This is a, would be an incorrect drawing because what we should see is lines converging to where there's no area. That would be flat. And that changing area that moves through is a wave. And there's something called the trace of the metric. This minus 111, or you could do four of these little lambda things for the top constant. I would replace that and say, well, maybe it should just be, the trace should be all zeros. And just so say, well, that's a perfect fluid with no waves in it. That's a perfect fluid with no uh, area in it. So just a little review. Why line segments? Well, line segment, you know, you can, you can look at the area of circles. You can look at the area of four-leaf clovers. Why do we want to use line segments? Because a line segment represents a change. The bigger the line segment, the bigger the change. The line segment has no width. If I have two line segments and there's no area, there's no change. I would use absolute area instead of scalar fields. I would use relative area instead of parallel lines. And this is a little wordy, but it's up here in case you don't want to look at it. Uh, partial derivative boundaries of absolute and relative area instead of gradients and manifolds. So I would basically dispute Gauss and Ryman when they were saying that manifolds and surfaces have something to do with physicality. Um, I would use pure geometric functions of area. An absolute area replaces the concept of linearity, and a relative area replaces the concept of nonlinearity. So, what I'm getting at now when I'm starting research is there's something called homeomorphisms of manifolds. They say if you look at a surface close enough, it'll start to look scalar, it'll start to look absolute or non -euclid, or Euclidean, it'll start to look flat. And I think what they mean is if I have that little slice of area, on one hand, there's a relative function between the two line segments. On the other hand, there's not. They're just absolute. But if you get that block of area and you squish it down, it's hard to tell the difference between relative area and absolute. How do I know that's not a better explanation? That's what I'm researching. Uh, and I would use pure physical theory functions of perfect fluids and temporal and spatial probabilities. And now that I can, I would use just pure geometric equations of relative area. And then lastly, of course, if area is quantized, does gravity have a wavelength? Yeah. So there's these plots you have, if you've ever seen dark energy, of after the Big Bang, and they say, well, now we know that the universe is accelerating its expansion. Well, some of the papers don't quite describe it correctly, but if you were, I can give you some um, references if you'd like. The trick in the graph where they show that the universe is expanding, accelerating, isn't that it's accelerating, and that's not the new thing, it's the inflection point. What they are saying is, and what some of these papers do realize, what the, the big crux of it is, that there's an inflection point. It means that the gravity, what happens in the universe, 
exploded out and just started coasting. And then all of a sudden, somewhere, the galaxy started forming, poof, everything started taking off. It's the inflection point. Because what they're saying is that one side of the universe and the other side of the universe, they had never had any communication since the beginning of the Big Bang. But yet somehow, that side of the universe and that one knew to start accelerating at the same point in time. Yet, we say nothing can travel the speed of light. So how did that dark energy, how did the vacuum fluid know to start moving at that side of the universe and that side of the universe at the same time, all across the universe? Maybe the simplest answer is nobody ever asked, well, why did that side start forming galaxies and why did that side start forming galaxies? Well, maybe the simplest answer is that that's just a property of matter. The reason it looks like it's starting to accelerate to expansion is simply because gravity has a wavelength. And that's what we're actually we're looking at. And then it's only attractive, it only appears attractive within it's, when it's within a certain wavelength. Once you get past that wavelength, there are no attractive forces in the universe. I know this is part of some of your other research, but that actually starts to look very attractive in this type of theory too, that there are no such thing as attractive forces at all. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> No, very good. I mean, I'm very intrigued because I got a math background and uh, a couple of things. Um, you're, I was really intrigued to see you using the squares mm -hmm. and talking about area. And this is getting then something that uh, here, my, my father and I are, are looking at the universe. And it comes back to this thing I'm, uh, we're going to be talking about this afternoon, but it's, you talked about uh, what, perfect fluid? Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about area, and area really is sort of digital. Uh, we, we have this idea that the, the universe is just made up of mass and movement. That's it. So I've come up with the conclusion that the universe is actually digital. If you look at it, you have to. You can't just look at every part of everything infinitely down and up. But when you finally say, "Okay, I'm going to look at this level," these things are pieces, and they're moving around. So it's sort of digital. Anything that you look out in the universe, and you were talking about this manifold, I had the same, I have the same uh, thought experiment for if you had an ultimate particle, and it's, let's say it's spherical, and you get closer and closer and closer to it, the surface becomes flatter and flatter and flatter. And it's infinitely dense. My question to you is, in all that you're doing here, which is, like I said, it's very fascinating, I think this is a wonderful journey you're going on and to follow you, do you see where do you see the difference between the actual physical universe and these squares versus a perfect fluid? Because one of the things my father said many years ago, which is, I, I believe wholeheartedly, is continuums or perfect you know, math, you can't apply force because it has no pieces, nothing to bend. You will never get to a place. Like you said, a segment right. shows. What, what do you see that, how that relate to the, the real universe? Because when you talk about the fluids, are you talking about the mathematical models and then the phys physics of the world, it, in the universe is different? Right. Well, see, the problem is, is that when you, when, like you're saying, how can you apply force to something that we mentally conceive as of having no edge? Or do we actually just take all these infinitesimal changes of area around a piece of fluid and then we sum all these up into one vector? And, and so then we can equate that to a fluid. To me, the way I see it is that you have to step back and say, you know, what if, when we write rho and p, even when, you know, I'm sure you guys know better than I do who came up with perfect fluids, when they about Nikowski and everybody, when they were coming up with these concepts of saying, what matter is this, we're going to model up a perfect fluid. And now, here we are 100 years later, and we're modeling the vacuum also.